Hello, welcome to Portal's portfolio series where we will have readings and interviews with student writers and published authors from Vancouver Island University and around the country. We will talk with them about what it takes to be a writer in the ever-changing world of publishing. So, uh, today we have with us Margo. Hi Margo, welcome. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, my name is Margo Fedoric and I'm um, a student at VIU. Um, I guess I could be a graduating student this year, but I'm enjoying it so much that I don't want to press the graduate button. So <laughs> I'm just trying to learn as much as I can about writing. So uh, are you a creative writing student? Yeah, that's my major and I'm finding because this is my second degree, um, I came in in my third year because they let you do that, go figure. Um, so I'm finding after two years, I really want to take all of the other writing courses that they offer. So I'm, that's what I'm doing. Nice. Um, how would you say creative writing compares to your previous degree or the previous uh, course content that you've taken? Do you find that uh, it allows for you to um, maybe condense your ideas better? Um, well, my first degree was in environmental studies. Uh, so I, I didn't do that much writing really. I mean, I did take the odd English class here and there, but I think it's also right now, how, how do I condense my writing? Is that what you're asking? Well, I, was, I guess I was just wondering if there was some uh, crossover between degrees. Where you... um, in a way, I guess it's sort of my subject matter. I like writing about the natural world and how I interact in it, I guess. Is it your love for the environment and nature that led you to writing and creative writing? No, it was just something I've always wished to do. You know, I guess a lot of people have certain dreams and that's a dream I've been sort of thinking about for years. And it's not it's since my children have grown up that I've sort of had the space and time to sort of knuckle down and learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said it's been a dream. How long would you say that you've uh, wanted to get into the world of writing? Well, you know, I was thinking about that and I, I was looking through an old, um, I used to keep diaries as a child and I wanted to write back then and don't ask me why I waited. I mean, I wrote here and there, but nothing, not like how it's pouring out now so for many mm. years. Um, on the note of writing, would you like to read something you've written. Sure. So this was a piece I wrote um, that was published in Portal 2020, and that's the background behind me. I just thought it's such a beautiful peacock that I should show it up. Uh, this is called In the Shade of Towering Cedars. I'm walking a trail in Sandwell Provincial Park with my youngest daughter, Chloe, who lived on Gabriola Island for all, most of her 18 years. We're headed towards an ancient Stanaimu burial cave near the cliffs. I used to carry her on my back down the same trail when my legs were young and strong. Her eyes were wide, taking in the scenery. Today, she reaches out her hand to help me up the incline. We are surrounded by green so dark it soaks up the sun and the moist air condenses to a damp layer on my skin. In the shadows, we see what looks like hip bones burnished with age. At the bottom of the trail, we pass ancient middens, remnants of shellfish feasts. For nearly two decades, my family and I have walked this 800 meter trail, bath towels carelessly slung over our shoulders, our fat dog Stella poking behind. Passing the moss-covered trunks of the big leaf maples, my husband Rick often remarked, look at those burls, I could make something great with those. We have mason jars filled with beach glass worn smooth, reminders of meals on damp sandy towels in the heat of summer. If you lay in the sand and position your body facing the marsh, you can imagine a time when Stenaimu canoed here to harvest clams. This was before the Spanish arrived, bringing smallpox with them. Though the Stenaimu couldn't know their fate, they likely found solace on the stretch of sandy beach, 
Mothers and fathers pulling their children in close, breathing in the cool ocean air, watching a kingfisher dip its head under the sea. When the tide is low, we take the shortcut back along the crescent-shaped shore, leaving footprints in the cold, hard sand, past pitted sandstone boulders, barnacles and purple starfish clinging to their sides. In the shade of towering cedars, two rock carvings, petroglyphs known to locals, stand guard. One carving is of a stick figure with an arrow, possibly inauthentic, and the other is a faded round face looking up at the sky. Gabriola is known as Petroglyph Island, with over 70 rock carvings scattered across the island. The best spot to view them is behind the United Church, Church off South Road, especially if wet weather has darkened the petroglyphs' grooves. On these rainy days, Rick and I watched as Haley and Chloe ran ahead of us. Now I bring my walking stick to maneuver the trails despite arthritic knees, and Stella perks up from her week-long nap to join me. Although her gait is slowing with age, she rallies to sniff the salal line path and ancient ferns. I stop to read the large white sign at the trailhead, erect, erected by Parks BC to explain it is difficult uh, to date rock carvings that could be 100 to 3,000 years old. There are many petroglyphs in the clearing at the end of the path, including one that reminds me of the plumed head of the local belted kingfisher. I am impressed by its smooth, curvy lines. Petroglyphs were made with handmade tools called hammerstones that pecked lines into the rock. I fight the urge to scrape back moss on flat surfaces to check for more underneath. Gabriola's forests, flat bedrock, and honeycomb sandstone along the 15 kilometer, kilometer length of the island were ideal for capture, capturing the local flora and fauna, or carvings otherworldly and intentionally unrealistic. The most impressive is a sea serpent or lightning snake that resembles the indigenous Hyatlik, a mythical creature with razor-like teeth ideal for the whale hunt. Explorers noticed the Hyatlik images painted onto the sides of local canoes. I also recognize salmon similar to those in Jack Point's Petroglyph Park in Nanaimo. With the de decline of the Nanaimo population due to outbreaks of disease, the meaning of the carvings have largely been lost but some stories remain and have been told to non-Indigenous audiences and recorded. <clears throat> a traditional story about the Jack Point petroglyphs explains that a dog salmon took the form of man to steal the chief's daughter. She would be his wife and return with him to the sea. The dog salmon and the wife swam upriver, leaping out of the water together. The chief went north to search for his daughter, but he was told she would return only once a year to Nanaimu and could not go home with him. During the yearly salmon run, only the chief and his descendants in their village were permitted to touch the salmon, roast it, and eat it whole. It could not be cut up for drying or smoking until the shaman performed a ceremony in front of the salmon petroglyphs. He painted a male and female dog salmon with red ochre, sprinkled with eagle down, shook his rattle, and sung over the fish as everyone joined in. Now, once a year on the south end of Gabriola, Islanders join together for a giant salmon barbecue at the community hall. We spread blankets on the grass and eat slabs of salmon with potato salad and a wedge of watermelon. Local musicians play on stage while children chase each other and dance barefoot on the grass. Ice cream and beer sales raise money for the hall and playground where we once found a nest of baby garter snakes writhing in the sun. Now that our daughters have left home, Rick and I trek the easier sandstone shore of the beach where I held my father's memorial four years ago, releasing his ashes into the sea on a hot August day. We had set our out blankets beneath the spreading branches of a maple tree to eat stuffed figs and chicken wraps. Both Haley and Chloe had taken the day off from jobs at local restaurants and my sister Kristen and her two children, Daphne and Thomas, took the ferry from Vancouver. Thomas found a flat piece of driftwood to balance a fancy cardboard box. Dad was born in Winnipeg, yet he asked to have his remains released near the shore where he took his grandchildren to catch fish, fish in rocky tide pools. We played drumming music from a CD player while Kristen placed colorful dahlias in the water. I read from a crumpled piece of paper. It only took minutes for the water, water to overturn the piece of wood and lap my father's ashes out to sea. I have learned young men on spirit quests laid prone on the petroglyphs to receive the power of these symbols. 
landscape echoes with their stories, the stories of Stenamu, but also my father's story and all those who once walked these trails. Today, Rick and I stopped to rest on the wooden bench overlooking the ocean, and I imagine the day we will walk here with the grandchildren who will play below on the rocks. The smooth head of a seal dips into the silver gray water, and I think of all of those lost to us. In the heat of summer, in the wind or pelting rain, I am compelled to visit these paths, lined with Gary Oak and echoing with the prehistoric voices of sea lions from across the strait. I will stand here, watching in the mist for canoes, for a couple of leaping salmon for my father, and I will listen for their stories. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, so, uh, this is a, a nonfiction piece. This is something that occurred. Yeah. Um, it says you, you lived on Gabriel for a long time? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm still on Gabriola. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely island. Um, so I guess uh, one another question I would have for you is, um, is this the first time you've been published? Uh, um, I've had little essays here and there published, but um, not in a literary magazine before. Mm. Have you um, applied anywhere or sent your, your work places? Before. Uh, yes, actually, I love sending out my work. It sort of motivates me to edit it a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I enter a lot of contests. Um, I kind of use them sometimes as, uh, you know, jumping off points, you know, it'll say something like to 1500 words in this genre. And that's sort of what gets me going. Yeah. Yeah. And you never feel, um, deterred or discouraged when you aren't chosen for these things? Oh, yes, I do feel you do discouraged. Yeah, definitely. But I, you know, you just sometimes might take me a couple of days to, you know, feel sorry for myself. And then I, you know, sort of brush it off and keep keep at it. Do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into being published or, or just writing in general? I, yeah, I just say you can't, you can't get published if you don't keep sending it out. And even people that have, you know, you know, if you think your writing is inferior, it's not. You just have to find the right piece for the right place. I think that's, you know, I've, I've heard many published authors tell me that and I hold it in my heart and think about this where they'll have a piece that they'll send out maybe 10 times and they'll think that it's terrible and then one time it'll get chosen for an award so mm -hmm. you know it depends who the judges are and what their style is and so i think you just have to keep keep at it do you ever show anybody uh incomplete pieces or things that you're working on um well my teachers right yeah. workshopping and yeah classes. i i trust them for that but i i try to edit it as much as i can before i send it out and, and sometimes i'll have actually a friend will go over it for me and then i'll go over it again so hmm. so yeah that helps do you have uh, anything you're working on right now outside of say uh course material uh, yes, I'm actually working on two things right now. I'm working on a graphic novel script, um, kind of about my family's history, sort of traumatic, traumatic history, I guess, coming over from the Second World War, and that I'm oddly enjoying it. And um, I'm also writing a memoir about living on Cape Rola with sort of a, a food twist mm -hmm. a memoir with recipes very cool yeah um all right well thank you very much for your time thank uh, you greatly appreciate it yeah it was nice speaking with you it was nice to meet you in yeah. person and yeah and to all the viewers thank you for watching the portal portfolio series portal is a literary magazine published by students in vancouver island university's creative writing and journalism department the territories of the Snanamo, Cowichan, and Tlahaman First Nations. For more information about Portal in our portfolio series, please visit portalmagazine.ca. Thanks.
Bye. Thank you.